Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Epting from Extra Harmer in New York City. And I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Michael? Yes. We've had a couple of good episodes lately. I got to come visit you. Yeah. We got to go to Sotheby's. Yes. We talked to Victoria from Stanley Gibbons. I feel like CWP has been on a roll. And I really think we are continuing uh, with this hot streak right now. Why don't you tell people who we're going to be talking to? Uh, today, we're talking to Carl Rove. So my understanding is that he's uh, he's been a philatelist for quite some time, and, and it runs in the family, I hear. I don't think most people know uh, Carl Rove as a philatelist, though. I would no. guess that most of our listeners have heard of him in uh, other contexts, mm-hmm. um, either as uh, chief of staff to President George W. Bush, or uh, many of the other political roles and just political commentators. I mean, I just, you know, I, I hear his name and I think of going over to my grandmother's house growing up and he was always, I, on election night, he was the go-to or whenever anything happened, I felt like he was always the the go-to uh, whenever my grandmother was watching the news on TV. So uh, this is just somebody who, uh, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people have this familiarity and awareness of him mm-hmm. as political, um, yeah. but, but not necessarily as stamp collector. And I think yeah. that's really fun. Um, you know, this is the, the first one of these that we've done with somebody who, you know, most people yeah. might not think of in this context. And I, th- I think that's what's really exciting for me. Yeah, it, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about his collecting interests and just kind of what what him, got him into the hobby. Because, again, it, not many people think about him this way. No, and, and, I, and, I, without... and it's not like it's it, it's not like it's private you know he he's no it's not spoke, like a secret it, no yeah. it's he's done so much else and and again he you know he, he's um uh you know thought you know, the other thing i love and yes. and not to give too much away about his his collecting because i want okay. to hear it in his own words but it is so closely linked to what he does professionally i love mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that it's not you know it's not completely unrelated to um uh, to his political life and i think that's what's so cool so again i want to hear it in his own words but yeah exactly. um, the I have fact some... that he's I have some questions that that touch directly upon that and and how is kind of collecting interests progressed progressed into that field, you know, so I feel like we're dancing around it. And I just can't wait to hear him talk about it because again, (laughs) I don't want to spoil it for people who don't know. Um, I will say that he uh, showed a couple of frames of material at the New York 2016 show. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the invited guests exhibits and uh, it was great stuff. It was, it was truly fantastic stuff. So, um, I'm excited. This is this is a big one. Again, yeah. I feel like conversations with philatelists is just uh, I don't know. I feel like I feel like we're finally uh, growing it into what we envisioned or maybe even didn't envision getting yeah. to go to Sotheby's and getting to talk <laughs> More to like Carl didn't Rove. envision. Yeah, no, I was going to say yeah, it's grown uh, you know, beyond what we uh, what we ever could have uh, thought yeah. of. So yeah. I'm uh, I'm really excited for this one. What do you say we, we bring Mr. Rove in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's bring him in. Good afternoon, Mr. Rove. I'm Charles. Nice to meet you. I'm Carl. Mr. Rove died July 2004. <laughs> Carl, thank you so much for joining us. We uh, we yeah, really appreciate you. it. Yeah. So it, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so to to kick things off, um, do you mind briefly explaining your start in philately? What got you into the hobby and 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 how you came to collect what you are collecting today? Well, uh, like most collectors, I think I came to it because of my parents, or specifically my father. My father and his father, uh, Louis Claude Rove and Louis Claude Rove Jr., were both um, original members of the, the classic, the American Classic Philatelic Society. Oh, wow. And in fact, somewhere around here, I still have my dad's route card. Uh, but uh, they were... Uh, so when I was growing up, they were, they were, my, my father lived in the Rocky Mountain West, as did I, obviously, and his father lived in Milwaukee, but they kept up an active correspondence. And uh, I remember my father showing me at a young age, uh, a sheet of the uh, three cent doll reds that my grandfather had plated. So he had identified a stamp for each one of the parts of the plate. I had no idea what that meant, but in retrospect, it was no wonder my grandfather shared it with my father. And I wish I could find the damn thing now, but uh, anyway, that got me involved in, I, I love it. I love history. I love, uh, I love, uh, uh, I, I, 
I've always loved history. And the stamps are a way to study history. And that was a lesson from my father. He, he'd show me a stamp and then talk about what the subject of it was and uh, who that person was and why it was important. And uh, that got me hooked. And and you're, uh, I was lucky enough to see some of your material at the New York 2016 show when you uh, when you exhibited there. How did you? And, and can can you describe for people who maybe don't know what the main focus of your collection is? And uh, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense on the one hand, but a lot of people don't really bridge their um, you know their professional life with the hobby necessarily. So can you talk about how you came to to sort of marry the two together? Yeah, I, I uh, my principal uh, object in collecting is uh, political covers of uh, of the eighteen of the nineteenth century specifically Republican uh, political covers. It used to be in starting in the 1850s and going through roughly the 1880s and 1890s that people could get envelopes that had the uh, picture of their favorite candidate on it and they could use them for their correspondence. And so, uh, for example, uh, I've got some here. Um, you know, I, I, I only collect Republicans and then here's, a, here's an example of the uh, there's Mr. Mr. Fremont. Yeah, Mr. Fremont, the people's candidate. And uh, and uh, with the slogan of the other Republicans that year, Freedom National Slavery Sectional. And uh, he had uh, he had the he had the first really extensive use of it, but uh, I've, I, I collect basically starting with Fremont and I've got a little bit in the 20th century, the early 20th, but it starts the habit starts to dry and dry up in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, but uh, I've got a rather robust uh, Freeman, both uh, Abraham Lincoln races, uh, Ulysses S. Grant is is pretty prolific, and uh, then it, it dies, starts to die after uh, dwindle after that, but it's pretty well gone by the McKinley era. Which, uh, but, but I do have a couple of those. And when did you start diving into that section of philately? Is that what you started with originally when your oh, when your father? I, I was like everybody. I had the you know I had the album in which you collected everything. And yeah. I had hinges and. All I cared was to fill a hole, and that lasted until uh, my, my late teens. But when I went off to college, I sort of got away from the habit, but got back into it in my 30s and 40s, and uh, when I had the money to, to be a little bit more specialized and, and focus on what I wanted. And uh, that's my principle. I, that's what I mostly collect, but I also collect, uh, I sort of, st sort of stumbled into it I, I, at the same time, that particularly in the 18 early 1860s you have a great many civil war patriotics mm. and i and, and they, they're they're as you know there, there are thousands of them i decided to collect uh covers that had only the american flag on it so i have this is my favorite right here this is uh well, let's see here yeah well no wait a minute where is it uh where is my favorite i got i grabbed the wrong one it sort of looks like it oh no that is it that is it so this is mailed from Hannibal, Missouri, home of Mark Twain, oh, wow. which was a Confederate stronghold. And the postmaster obviously was not a fan of the Union. He was a Southern sympathizer because he has taken his stamp, his uh, cancellation stamp, and stamped all over the American flag. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've got a lot of these. This is another one that's one of my favorites. It's got two of the, uh, of the uh, 12 cent stamps uh, from Apple River, Illinois, to uh, Cornwall, England, and uh, wow. what's a foreign use of, of a patriotic cover? But my main my main interest is the political covers, and, and to the degree that I'm I'm sort of running out of, I'm, I'm now trying to be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, demanding. I guess it is because I've got so many, and so many of them are of the same cover, and and there's not any not a big difference in the usage of them. But I, it, it, it really is funny. You can sort of tell. Here's another one. Here's a Lincoln cover from uh, from 1860, and he has stamped it. The postmaster <laughs> stamped it over Lincoln's face, so there's literally the date is is a black dot on Lincoln's nose. I don't think that was an accident. He could have stamped it over here, but he went and put it right on Lincoln. I guess back then, you know, postmasters were appointed by the by the presidential party, so that must have been a Democratic postmaster appointed by uh, by James Buchanan, who was still in office at that point. <laughs> My favorite political. Uh, my favorite political uh, item, however, is not a cover per se, but is rather a document. It is a fundraising letter. 
that uh, I don't have the, the cover, but I got the letter. And it says, gentlemen, the stupendous efforts which are being put forth by the party in opposition to the administration to secure the election of their candidate call for a corresponding effort on the part of the friends of the administration and government to defeat their purposes and to secure to the country the re-election of our present able and worthy president, Abraham Lincoln. It goes on and says, you know, says to secure the election in every state beyond the possibility of a doubt, not only does it require the patriotic efforts of every man, but it requires a contribution as well. So send money. And the Amazing letter, how nothing has changed. <laughs> well, one thing has changed. This is on the letterhead of the military division of the Mississippi, the quartermaster's office of U.S. military railroads. It is from a government official <laughs> to the contractors who are who are getting uh, you know gi giant government checks from them in response. So this doesn't happen anymore. But I, I, that's one of my favorites. Well, so I, I have to ask, given your your background in direct mailings, do you see any sort of uh, correspondent uh, a correlation between what was going on in the 1850s and 60s and the way that mail is used to influence political campaigns, you know, throughout the 20th century? Do you, do you see a sort of lineage there um, over the, the course of the century? Well, it, it's not exactly the same. You're right. My, my early days in political consulting, I was a direct mail guy. Uh, but this was, a, you know, think about this. This is the visible expression of local enthusiasm about politics. These are, these are you know, ordinary Americans who send in whatever, 50 cents and get, you know, 20 envelopes or 50 cents and get 100 envelopes. I don't know what, I'm, I'm still looking for a price list someplace, but I guess Mil, Dr. Milgram has figured that out. I just haven't, haven't found the right part of his book to talk about it. But they, they, they wanted to show the support for their candidate, Republican or Democrat, mostly Republican from what I can figure out by just simply looking at what comes available in catalogs. But they wanted to have something that showed their support. And I mean, it's not that the, the correspondence is necessarily very political. In fact, most of it, I've gotten a, I've gotten a letter saying, you know, I'm so pa sorry about the passing of our dear cousin. Uh, you know, I'll try and be at the, you know, I'll try and be at the church on Saturday. So, you know, I've gotten, uh, you know, I've gotten expressly political letters in here. Most of the covers come without correspondence, but but even some of them, this is sort of a weird one. So here is a cover that is sent from the banking office of uh, uh, L.S. Lawrence. He's a, Chicago, he's a New York banker writing to uh, Chauncey Witherfield in Chesterfield, Mass. And his letter says, uh, has, has business, here's, uh, I'm sending you, in essence, a draw for $18 and uh, another draw for $100 onto on your credit, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, I will back you up uh, to uh, Fillmore uh, and the Union and the Constitution with all my heart, away with Fremont and the, and then there's a racial exp expletive there, respectfully yours, S.A. Lawrence. So the guy, why is the guy using a Fremont envelope to mail a letter to one of his banking customers and saying, I'm with you on Fillmore, I'm not going for this radical Fremont. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, fun to, it's fun to read the letters, but it's amazing to think that most of these people just, all they were doing was they were showing their support by sending, you know, their normal correspondence, writing a letter to a, to the, to a, a cousin about the death of their mutual cousin, uh, writing a, a, you know, a letter to convey some piece of business, writing a friend or family member, uh, to catch them up on what was going on at the uh, at, at their uh, at their place, and uh, and yet, uh, you know, there's there, there wasn't as sophisticated as we as we have today with letters that you know are personalized and talk all about politics, but it's about the personal of their own lives, and it's fun. To, one one of the things I enjoy about this is, and this is a great advantage of the internet is, is that we can now find out who these people are. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was searching on Rufus, Rufus Deering uh, in, in uh, Brunswick, Maine, uh, Maine. Well, come to find out, Rufus Deering owned a large lumber yard. He started out as a abolitionist. He was a longtime Republican. In his later years, he became a prohibitionist. He got, he got a, his first wife died and he got married to a much younger woman as his second wife, lived a very long life. And guess what? The lumber yard is still in business today in Brunswick, Maine. Wow! So pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you, if you find you, you feel like you got a little sense of what life is about. Now, there's no letter with his, but I got another one uh, with a fellow who who uh, uh, 
who was writing to uh, uh, a, a, a family member in upstate New York and is talking about uh, all the difficulties he has in, uh, in, in his uh, farm and then talks about how he hopes for the victory of Fremont and everybody is on fire in his part of the world about Fremont. How is it in yours? And yeah, so it's wonderful to get a sense of, you know, a little glimpse into somebody's life. It's incredible. Franklin Roosevelt famously used stamps as a way to unwind and, and give him some some peace and, and sanity, especially during the war years. How much a part of your life were stamps during the White House years for you? Was it something that you sort of had to put aside when when things got busy or was is this something that's been you know, since you picked it back up in your 30s or 40s? Has it been pretty consistent? Yeah, well, it, it was everything was less uh, was less available and less paid attention to during the White House years, except for I did make one acquisition during the White House years, and I, I did so deliberately uh, because it had a White House connection. This is a letter written in a form letter from the rooms of the of the of the uh, Loyal National League. The Republicans in 1864 decided that they were going to call themselves the, the 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 Union Party in order to bring in anti-war Democrats, and this was an outgrowth of an effort that had begun in 1862 and really reached a great deal of activity in 1863, particularly in northern cities with uh, large democratic populations called the, 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 national, uh, the, the uh, Loyal National League, which was, in essence, mostly Republicans, but some Democrats um, who uh, supported the war effort. And this is a, a, uh, uh, a form letter. It's printed with handwritten notes here uh, saying, we're going to have a meeting of the executive committee uh, and uh, uh, we're, thanks for accepting the invitation to speak. And this is to a New York lawyer uh, whose name I can't really uh, figure out. I think it's Thomas Vilmelier, a, a Dutch name, but I, I've not been able to find any evidence of him. But it's like the mass meeting is going to be on September 11th, and we'd like you to come to the reception at 3 o'clock before we, we start. And it's got a little handwritten uh, hand like this pointing to the important news of the detail of when you're going to be, uh, we're going to begin the meeting with prayer. And then it says, uh, very respectfully yours, James A. Roosevelt, father of Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. Wow. Incredible. Wow. So that was acquired during the, uh, uh, during the White House time for you. White House years. I, I must admit, though, I did, I, I would sort of buy things and, and put them in a box and, and uh, not, not really organize them and it's only later when I had more time. So kind of following along the same questioning, Charles and I, when we talk to our peers outside of the hobby uh, about what we do or what we collect, uh, you know, we find it's kind of 50-50. Some of them get really excited and, and want to know more. And then some of them sometimes, you know, don't quite understand it. In speaking with your peers, if you have around, you know, uh, what what it is you do as professionally, what were some of the reactions to um, your collecting habits and when you explained to them uh, what it is you collect? Well, they, they were shocked when I admitted that I was an open practicing philatelist. <laughs> I mean, they thought I was laid back and, you know, sort of uh, prim and proper and to be so open about it. Now, look, I, what I find is, is, first of all, people know that I was in the direct mail business. In fact, I picked up a bad habit in the direct mail business that I literally cannot get away from. Uh, back when I was in the direct mail business, I would, uh, as you know, uh, lots of people collect, uh, lots of people distrusted banks. So they went out and bought sheets of stamps and had large collections of those that they really didn't collect. It was just sort of like rather than put money in the bank, buy stamps. And all those are now coming on the market. And serious collectors and serious stamp dealers will pick out the stuff that's valuable and then to try and get their cash out on the rest. And so you can buy those for, for less than their face value. So being a cheapskate, I would buy a lot of them and I would send out all of my bills and my communications using multiple old stamps on the envelopes. <laughs> and it, 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 it proved to be valuable from a business perspective because I cannot tell you the number of times that, the, that, the, that generally the woman in charge of paying the bills someplace would say, we love getting your bills. Mm -hmm. You have such beautiful stamps. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I once had a funny, uh, a funny uh, uh, meeting about it. Uh, I had a great, I have a great political friend in Dallas that we used to do a lot of work together. He was sort of the chief political advisor, outside political advisor to Senator Phil Graham. And, and uh, the Phil Graham's um, uh, 
uh, finance chairman was his boss, H.R. Bum Bright. Only in Texas do you, you know, sort of have to have a, a, a nickname. H.R. Bum Bright was the owner of the Dallas Cowboys and a gigantic oil company and a gigantic bank and a gigantic trucking company and vast amounts of land. And he was wealthy, a very wealthy. And Jim Francis, my friend, worked for him. And we would have meetings for the Graham Kitchen Cabinet on, on generally on sort of Saturday afternoons. <clears throat> and if they were in Dallas, they were at Mr. Bright's office. So one uh, I had to go up for a, a Graham meeting. So I went up early and Jim and I, went, I came in the night before, met Jim in his office the, the next morning, have a cup of coffee, talk about things before the meeting. And he said, Mr. Bright is in, let's go pay our respects. So Mr. Bright required all of his top executives to be at the office on Saturday morning until noon, and then they could leave. And he had this gigantic office with formal French tapestries, tapestries and a gigantic desk, but he rarely used it except for ceremonial reasons. He actually hung out in a little room right behind there. He was a Texas A&M Aggie. And so he had the first desk, metal desk that he got when he got out of uh, A&M and became an engineer. He, he still had his original desk and that's where he hung out. So we go to this little company hole and there's this wealthy owner of the Dallas Cowboys. And there is his equally ancient lawyer. The two of them are talking over a couple of issues and we go to say hello. And Mr. Bright introduces me to his lawyer. And he says to the lawyer, he says, you know, Carl sends a lot of mail to Jim. I had to send Jim regular reports on the direct mail fundraising and so forth. And so there'd be a couple of envelopes a week. Uh, and he says, when, when Carl Mail sings to Jim, he sends them with really valuable old stamps. And he opens up, you don't have to, in those metal desks, you got the big drawer. He opens up the big drawer and there is every envelope that I've sent Jim for the last six months with all these old stamps on it. He says, he points to the lawyer and says, these are really valuable. And he says, what I do is I wait until I fill up my drawer and then I take them home and then I put them in a big pot. His, he and his wife would put them in a big pot of of uh, hot water and boil them and the stamps would come out. He said, I got myself some tweezers and then we put them on some special paper and we lay them on my bed until they get dry. And he says, I got so many of these, you can't believe it. And they're really valuable. And the <laughs> lawyers go, mm, thank you, bum. That's interesting. That Carl, that's an interesting habit, Jim. That's nice of you to give your envelopes to Mr. Bright. And I'm thinking, Mr. Bright has no idea those stamps are, are worth less than the, you know, the face value on them. But at least he got some enjoyment out of it. So I've got one guy who may not have turned into a serious collector, but he was a persistent collector. <laughs> That's incredible. That's amazing. That's hilarious. Yeah. I must admit too, when 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 sometimes when people come over and they say they they they, they jog me about being a stamp collector because I got I got on one wall of my uh, office here at home I've got a framed uh, copy of the uh, of the uh, of of the of the the official stamps for the White House uh, from the classic era. And then over there, I have a, uh, I'll tilt it up a little bit there. I have, that's the that's a reprint for the original plates of the blue Mauritius and the orange Mauritius. Wow. So people ask me what that's about and I tell them what it's about. And if they're interested, I'll pull out some of my albums. And I must admit, they sort of they sort of get into it. They sort of like, well, that's really cool. And what I've noticed is, particularly on the flags, you know, the flags. After a while, you can only look at so many American flags, but you start seeing some interesting combinations of stamps. And I must admit, it's caused people to say, "Boy, that is really beautiful," or mm. "That's really unusual." Look at all those stamps on there. And uh, uh, so it, you know. They may not, they may not become collectors, but at least they're there. They know that it's a serious hobby and worthy of a certain amount of respect by God. Yeah. Yeah. What has your, um, uh, relationship been like with the hobby? You were invited to give a Tiffany talk for the American Philatelic Society. I know, like I said, I, I was lucky enough to see, uh, the New York 2016 show was my first big international stamp show. That was sort of when I cut my teeth in the hobby. So what is it like to have, um, you know, sort of been embraced by the, the organized side of the hobby? Well, I was very uh, honored to uh, to show in the New York. I, was, I frankly was nervous because I never, you know, I never had shown anything. I carried around, I, you know, added in in uh, in albums, and that was it. So, uh, you know, I literally went and got a, uh, and I shouldn't have done this. I, I got a calligrapher, a woman who whom I knew did calligraphy, and and uh, I, I wrote up descriptions of them and did the did the sheets. But but 
um, you know, a couple of uh, a couple of senior guys in the in the in the in the, in the uh, hobby helped guide me in what to do and what materials to get and so forth. I actually, found it to be a lot of fun. In fact, I'm trying to find some time. Probably, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to teach a class this fall on short notice, so I was planning to do this this summer to get very serious about doing with my uh, flag covers what I'd done with some of my political covers, and that is actually put them in books. And you know, I've actually got a couple of a uh, couple of uh, ruled boxes that I can use and so forth based on the size. But, um, you know, uh, I hate to say it, I was, I was invited to give the, the lecture, as you mentioned, um, shortly after I left the White House. And I found out later, it was at a meeting in Richmond, and I found out later that that was a somewhat controversial, that the war in Iraq had split the philatelic community. And so there were some who said, we don't want the warmonger to come. And so they apparently had some cancellations for the dinner. And I think a little bit of regret on the part of the, of the guy who figured out he'd invite me to it. But I, I had a lot of fun. And, and it was I, more than anything else, it was a way for me to pay tribute to my father and my grandfather because they were serious collectors. And uh, uh, they were collectors their entire life. My father, uh, when he passed, uh, had left uh, some, of, uh, some of his, not his collection per se, but of, of research books which i still have today of uh of his research and uh it just you know it's nice to know that there's a shared experience uh, i look back as a child uh you know taking my allowance from mowing lawns or delivering the sparks tribute in sparks nevada newspaper and uh, you know I, I look now and i say well that's the five cent american music stamp i can remember buying that at the post office being thrilled to be able to be there on the first day of issue and buy myself a five cent stamp and go home and eagerly affix a, a uh, hinge to it and put it in my album, thereby devaluing the very valuable five cent American music. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's, uh, and it's great. It, it, it really is great to just sort of thumb through these and, you know, get on the internet. I mean, I can imagine how much more interesting it would have been if I'd been a child and with the access to the internet to explore covers. I mean, it's, it, it was, uh, you know, think about all the material that you could, you, you, you get a stamp and say, well, who is that guy or gal? What are they, what is that, what is that event? And what does that mean? And, uh, you know, I, I, I would have to go search a history book. And now today you can tickle a couple of keys on your computer and find out all that you want to know about. It. Yeah. Yeah. The internet has definitely made the documentation and research side of, of philately a lot easier. And uh, yeah. I hope it will, it'll make it easier and more intriguing for, for people coming into it. But yeah. so do you have, any plans to exhibit any of your other material in uh, in the future? I'd love to. I've just I got to find the time, and more importantly, I got to find the gumption because I got to <laughs> tell you, I, I said no, no, come on, I, I don't have anything worth looking at. I mean, look at all these people who've got these fantastic exhibits. I don't even know how to put together an exhibit, so it was a lot of fun to do it. And I'd like to find some time to do it in the future. Mike, you were going to ask a question as well about is, is there an item that. Uh... Yeah, I did have um, one. You showed us your your favorite um, your favorite patriotic cover, but I was going to ask if you had a an item that you searched for forever that you knew through documentation or had seen in an auction catalog or something that you'd looked for for quite some time or something that uh, that kind of eluded you. Well, I, I I have what's eluded me. I hope to win in the in the next uh, auction you have. I have not been able to get a Garfield Arthur cover, and uh, and there's one coming up in your auction, and I've bid I've bid generously high, and I I hope nobody else tries to outbid me or cost. Uh, yeah, no, I I, uh, I I and the other thing is is I really as as you may know I've written a book about uh, the election of 1896, so I that was something I wanted to ask you about because that is sort of after the the campaign covers uh, had their heyday, but I was wondering if mail played much of a role in. Yeah, it it does still in those in those election in that election. It's 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 it is an election in which, ironically enough, more money more material is printed than it had ever been printed before. The, an average of fourteen pieces of material are printed for every vote cast in that election. The Republicans wow. the Republican campaign is led by uh, by by McKinley. History generally gives uh, the role of campaign manager to Mark Hanna, but in reality, the actual campaign manager is a thirty-one-year-old kid who is like the son that McKinley has never had. His name is Charles G. Dawes. And in my book, I make the case that he is the actual manager because 
for the for the roughly 111, 112 days between the Republican convention and the general election, uh, I, I was able to trace Hannah's travels, and he's on the road for over 70 days out of the 111, and for for less than 40 days is he in Canton with a candidate, Cleveland in his office, or in Chicago. Most of the time he's on the road, mostly in New York and Boston and Philadelphia and traveling on the East Coast. And you camp back in the area before, you know, the internet and cell phones and fax machines and, you know, you, you can't run a campaign or long distance telephones. I mean, if you had a long distance telephone in 1896, it rang one place at the other <laughs> end of the line. There's a line strung between the Republican headquarters in Chicago and major, uh, uh, then Governor McKinley, uh, he'd like to be called a major. He was a Civil War veteran who started the war as a private and ended the war as a major, having survived three uh, battlefield uh, suicide missions. And he, he was a congressman, governor, and president, and he preferred to be called the major. He said, I don't know about those other titles, but I know I earned that one. But Major McKinley had a, had a phone in, literally hanging it off of his dining room where he took phone calls from, from Charles Dawes. So uh, Dawes, Dawes is the architect of all this campaign material, and I've, I've tried to collect some of it. There's a little bit of uh, a few covers uh, that, are, that are oriented towards the race, uh, and they, are, and they were clearly used for official communications. There's, there's one that I've got in that came from the headquarters from McKinley, McKinley's headquarters in Nashville, Tennessee, which was led by a, a, a very uh, early supporter of McKinley's who was nearly elected governor. Uh, two years previously but anyway um yeah mckinley i i'm 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 going to try and collect more mckinley printed material but but most of what's out there is campaign material and it's not it's very perishable it's printed on cheap paper not designed to last very long but they did literally uh, theodore roosevelt passes through chicago on his way back from a hunting trip to north dakota and, and watches uh watches uh the campaign workers load uh railroad cars full of campaign material to send off to the campaigners. That's incredible. Well, okay. You've shown us some amazing things. We have something coming up for sale in September. I hope you don't mind if I show you something before yeah. the, the rest of the world has seen it, but I, I would love to get your take on this. Uh, apparently the postmaster of Carmel, New York was a big fan of, uh, of Hayes oh in 76. Oh my God, look at that. Hayes so and Weaver. The, it's the it's the only recorded strike of that uh, fancy cancel for the uh, for the the Hayes and Wheeler. Are you just trying to bait me into bidding for it? Come on, man. <laughs> I, I, it, it, I, I went and picked uh, this collection up in Chicago a couple of days ago, and again, you're the first person outside of the office to see okay. this. So, I, I just wanted to I, again. I, I, I um, it's amazing too. You talk about how the postmasters were political appointees. Um, I don't think people realize that today the post is is you know, with the exception of the last few months, I guess, uh, so separate from from the political sphere. But back then, I mean, they literally used their um, their standing as postmaster to, you know, and, and Albany, New York, has the fancy cancellation for Lincoln in the uh, the Circle with Stars. So it's amazing how political postmasters would get even. Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, the postmasters were a key part of the of the uh, of the existence of both political parties, and particularly for the Republicans in the South, it was critical because you know maybe most of the supporters of the Republicans in the South were poor blacks. And so if you met, made somebody, a uh, re black Republican, the postmaster of Buford, South Carolina, for example, which was held by a black Republican, uh, you were guaranteeing them the livelihood and uh, uh, for somebody who was an important cog in the local Republican machine. But yeah, very, that's very interesting. What, what about a private treaty arrangement? Here? <laughs> uh, speaking of postmasters, uh, the, uh, one of the, uh, or it should be uh, the uh, Hayes and Wheeler, I got it. A uh, I bought a cover a couple of years ago that is neither political nor uh, uh, nor uh, uh, flag, but it is a it is a cover I saw, and it was and it was very modest in price because it's a you know it's a from the from the classic era, but it's it it was there there didn't seem to be anything you know on the surface of it that was attractive, but but to me it saw it was something because the letter is from is signed with the congressional Frank. Of Rutherford B. Hayes, and it's addressed to J.P. Bryan, Galveston, Texas. Now, a lot of people wouldn't recognize that, and obviously they did because I got away with buying it for a song. But the Bryan family are one of the original founders of Texas. They're 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 part of the old 400. Uh, 
the families that were brought here by Stephen F. Austin to colonize Texas. And J.P. Bryant Jr. is a great friend of mine. He's just turned 80. He's a wonderful guy, great Texan, has one of the most fantastic collections of Western, uh, uh, Western Americana that you've ever seen in your life. So I bought the cover and I wrote him and I said, why is Rutherford B. Hayes writing to your forebearer? Well, come to find out in the 1850s, Rutherford B. Hayes and J.P. Bryan of Galveston, Texas, were classmates at a small school, a small university in Ohio, and they remained lifelong friends. No so there, there, there is something I would never have known had I not been a stamp collector that Rutherford B. Hayes had a close and dear friend who was his college chum, who was one of the founders of Texas. He, he's in that particular J.P. Bryan is in the second generation of the Bryans in, in Texas, or maybe the third, uh, but I think it's the second, and I think there are now eight generations of Bryans who've lived in Texas. Wow. It, 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 stamp collecting means so many things to so many different people, but for you, the, the, the stories, and I think that's why, you know, when you show things to people who, who maybe aren't interested, I, I, I would, you know, it's much easier to sell somebody on a story like that or a campaign cover than it is to sell them just a no offense, but a page full of mint stamps might not have the same appeal or the same mm. story. But but again, the fact that for you, it's just an extension of your career, an extension of your love for history. Um, I, I that that's what um, I think brought so many, myself included, brought so many of us into the hobby in the first place. And uh, and, and and it's about so much more than just the little bits of paper that have existed for 150 years. When it, when you have those connections and you can tie it to somebody you know personally, uh, that, yeah. I, I think that's what what proves just how uh, incredible this hobby really is. I uh, I bought a uh, I bought a small collection of Civil War letters, uh, and uh, written to written by two, uh, well written by one soldier. His brother apparently is illiterate because he, he writes what he writes in his letters what his brother wants to tell his mother, uh, the Corbetts in Pennsylvania. And uh, while I was at the White House, I used one of my uh, privileges, so to speak, to ask the National Archives tell me what happened to these two guys and come to find out they both died and so i have the correspondence probably the last letter that, that he wrote to his mother before he's killed in front of fredericksburg in 1862 and wow. uh, you know it's uh gives you goosebumps yeah. yeah and i mean if you know you think about that i mean every stamp is, is got a story and maybe the story is not a particularly exciting or interesting one you know uh but there's a story behind it and i i really that's one of the enjoyments that I get out of it. I mean, you know, it's like, remember our man Fremont? Let's end with Fremont. Fremont <laughs> yeah, is absolutely. The, Fremont is the brave guy who comes forward and is the Republican nominee in 1856, runs a spirited campaign. His chief consultant in the race is his wonderful wife, who's whip smart, the daughter of, of Senator Benton of, of uh, Missouri. But in 1864, he has a gigantic ego. The war is not going well. And so he decides that he is going to be potentially a candidate to block the nom renomination of Abraham Lincoln and to lead the Republicans into the fall campaign. And he even goes so far as to pick out his running mate, uh, who is a, a fellow named, uh, named John Cochran, who's from New York, both of them pictured in their military uniforms. And then I got a wonderful color one here, Major General J.C. Fremont for president in 1864. And he's writing, somebody is writing on his behalf to the president of the Iowa State University in Iowa City. But uh, fortunately, uh, nobody wanted to support him. Lincoln is renominated, fully expects to lose, writes the famous letter to, to, uh, to uh, public letter that he has each of the members of his cabinet sign without being able to read it, and then puts it in his drawer so that after the election, he can release the letter that says, now having lost the election, we now will attempt to save the union in the days between now and March 4th. Of course, you know, Sherman takes Atlanta, the Republic, the Unionists, uh, the Union forces have military victories uh, across the country. And uh, election day, uh, uh, he wins a vast majority of the, of the uh, soldier vote and is reelected president of the United States. But uh, for a while, John C. Fremont thought maybe I could come back. Uh, you know, eight years after I got my ass whipped, maybe I could come back. A very audacious move to uh, go up against Lincoln, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We forget Lincoln is as, wasn't as popular back then. As he's become in retrospect, the man, the man had people who on both sides criticizing him, people who thought he wasn't moving fast enough and people who thought he was moving too fast, too far. So, well, 
Carl, thank you so much for for joining us. This has been a, a real thrill. Um, again, just to to get to talk shop with you and and uh, again, so, so many people know you uh, for your political contributions. To get to talk to you as a, a fellow stamp collector has just been a, a real uh, joy and honor for Michael and I. Yeah, well, thank absolutely. You. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for this. It's a uh, it's a uh, great fun for me, and uh, hope it's of of, of utility to uh, to our fellow collectors. Charles, thanks so much for. Uh, proposing this you you, yeah. you didn't tell me you were 18 years old <laughs> 27 <laughs> and then your your co-interviewer was 17 years old <laughs> no yeah. we're, we're 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 fortunate to have gotten involved in the hobby so young and uh yeah, yeah to, to have made it our livelihood and, and we're just trying to share that that joy and that excitement so no we i, I thank you for your your prompt response i i yeah. i was sort of a shot in the dark reaching out to you but i i really appreciate it. I, I was so excited when when i saw your email pop up Lower your expectations and get out more often. That's my advice. <laughs> Thank you, boys. Appreciate no, thank you it. so much. Thank you so much. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Michael, that was uh, – I, I didn't expect to get a show and tell. I'm going to yeah. be honest. I yeah. didn't expect for him to, to – But, I mean, what incredible material. And the stories. This is somebody yes. who gets it. This is somebody who – he's like one of us. He's had such a different – Mm -hmm. life trajectory as as we've had and yet we, like he, he talks he speaks the same language as us and yeah. our listeners yeah which is what's so cool was, to me. It, was there the story the stories again yeah. the fact you know you're talking about the, the two brothers who died and talking about the free yeah, the fremont campaign where he's like i'm going to run against abe lincoln in the middle of the civil war mm -hmm. these are the things that that i think um are are sort of so relatable and so mm -hmm. transcendent across yeah. the hobby um and and the the way he talked about his nervousness to exhibit when some of we saw some of the material is it's insane exhibitable material, material yeah and it's just you know how about his grandfather plating the uh, three right? cent reds he comes right. from a real <laughs> philatelic lineage too yeah. i mean the, the yeah, rogue family is obviously uh you know again he, he was was born into to really great again they were classic society members they were yes. he has his the root agent part of his father i uh, <laughs> that whole conversation i'm just yeah. i'm i'm like i'm i'm buzzing after that. that was so much fun that was a lot of fun um i didn't again like you said i did not expect a show and tell and then when no. he had multiple binders that he started unclipping yeah, yeah. and showing that stuff I, that was i love that that was yeah. just uh that was just so cool that was um I, 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 I can't thank uh, Carl Rove enough for, for joining yeah. us. That was, yeah. I, I can't wait to see, I, I hope he finds time to exhibit. Obviously he's yes. got a busy schedule. Right. Um, but, but I, I really hope that he's able to put something else together because I would love to see it personally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, um that was, that was a real treat. That was, uh, um, I don't even know how to wrap that one up. That was so <laughs> much fun. Um, yeah. If you, uh, if you had just listened to this, he did show us quite a lot of material. You should go. You I, should go look. We didn't know that. Go in take the a intro. look. We we yeah. recorded the intro beforehand, and uh, no, you should you should go watch because that was. But, and the fact that he's got the framed Mauritius reprints yeah, on his bike. Yeah. This is a, this is a stamp guy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the passion was definitely there, but yeah. um, that was awesome. Uh, the story that I, I just keep thinking the story of the owner of the Cowboys soaking stamps. I, yeah, yeah, that, I, was really I, funny. Uh, that was that was one of the most fun conversations I think we've we've had so far. That was yeah. um. That was a real treat. And again, just a huge thank you to, to Carl for, for taking the time to join us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you, everyone listening. If you yeah. want to get in touch with us, uh, philatelypodcast at gmail.com. Our website on, is philatelypodcast.com. Yep, yeah, we're on uh, YouTube, Spotify, all the podcast places, as as always. But, I mean, Sorry, that thanks, was, guys. That thanks was, for listening. Thank you. That, that, that was a fun one. Let's. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think we can say anything else. Let's just. Uh, yeah. I'm ready to call it a day after that one. Yeah. Well, it, we should probably talk about our live streams. Um, uh, Friday mornings. Uh, Friday we're still mornings. working on the exact time. Follow us yeah. on Twitter or uh, or check the website for more information. Friday mornings, we are doing a half hour live stream though to talk about the latest philatelic news. Yep, we did one um, last Friday. It's now posted on audio and it's on YouTube. If you want to check it out, we'll, we'll be posting the audio. We'll be archiving them on YouTube yeah. for people to um uh to listen to. But uh, I'm I, I'm I can't wait for this episode to drop so I can go oh, yeah. back and listen to it again. I, oh yeah, you know usually I, I listen through them you know, once or so, but this one's going to be in like constant rotation for me because this was so much yeah, fun. It definitely was. Um, so um, awesome, Michael. Great, uh, thank as you. As always, great talking to you, and uh, I'll see you again real soon. Yeah, absolutely. Bye.